Well, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're really excited to be with you uh, today. My name is Linda Ormsby, and I direct the uh, Kentucky Water Resources Research Institute on campus, which is one of the uh, environmental centers. And uh, today we brought together uh, three representatives from some state or local organizations that uh, engage the community and also help us protect and restore Kentucky's Waterways Alliance. So they're both involved in environmental work and also community engagement. And so our three speakers today are gonna to be Ward Wilson, who's the executive director of the Kentucky Waterways Alliance. I'm Melissa McAllister, who's the chair of Watershed Watch in Kentucky. And so these two organizations, uh, first we'll look at have a statewide focus. And then Amy Soner is the executive director of Bluegrass Green Source, uh, which does a lot of community engagement uh, around environmental issues here in the Bluegrass area. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, Ward, I'll let you get started. Well, hi everyone, I'm Ward Wilson. Uh, I don't look like that picture anymore. That's an old picture. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm the executive director of uh, Kentucky Waterways Alliance. We're a statewide group and our mission is to protect, restore and celebrate the waterways of Kentucky. And I'm so glad to be here with you all on Earth Day. Um, so our vision is a Kentucky that sustains and celebrates our vast network of healthy waterways. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know, we have over 90,000 miles of streams and rivers and waterways in this state. And they're beautiful and they, they deserve protection and they all should be there for uh, the wildlife and the people who use them. So we have four goals in our strategic plan. And so I thought I'd just hit those high points uh, and tell you how we work. The first goal is working on the watershed level. And watersheds are big. Uh, the, the Ohio River watershed covers many states, uh, two small ones that are in your neighborhood. Uh, we work at all different scales. We work on the Ohio River. Uh, we work on small little watersheds like Bacon Creek too in Hart County. Um, so we try to get with people who live in that area and activate them. And so we defend clean water. That's the protect part of our mission. We learn what we can. We get the information out to people. We march on Washington if we need to. We've been up in, uh, on Capitol Hill talking to our elected officials too. Uh, and the third goal, third way is we just make people aware. You know, people are not gonna work to protect and restore waterways if they don't even know about them. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't know their home waterway. And most people don't know their watershed address. Uh, so we work in all sorts of ways from fun things like drinking beer to planting habitat for monarch butterflies to cleanups, whatever we can do to get people uh, to know, uh, know and care. And that's the engaging part of this. And then we work through partnerships. Uh, you know, we, we've only got a few staff. Uh, we do a lot of work and the only way we can do it is through partnerships. We partner with everybody on this call and, and, and value that partnership. We try to bring you know, the strengths we have and we combine them with the strengths of the other groups and it's just great. It's, it's the best way to get things done and it's the most fun way too. So that's it, that's the quick version. Uh, thank you very much and I'll look forward to questions. All right, thank you, uh, Ward. And so we're gonna hold questions to the end, but uh, one of the objectives of this session was just to expose everybody to some of the statewide or regional organizations uh, that, that basically help protect our waterways. And uh, so that maybe you hadn't heard about them before, uh, but hopefully you had. And at the end of our presentations, we'll give you a chance to ask some questions. So our next presentation is by Melissa McAllister, who is the chair of Watershed Watch in Kentucky. And she's gonna give us a little bit of overview of uh, that organization and what they do. So Melissa. Okay, thank you. Um, continuing on Ward's theme of um, uh, relating to your local waterways and helping protect them, I um, help lead the Watershed Watch in Kentucky organization, which is a volunteer water sampling group that looks at our streams, rivers, and lakes. And next slide. Um, we have a mission statement to um, improve and protect water quality by raising community awareness and supporting implementation of the Clean Water Act and other water quality regulations. But our goal is really uh, with our tagline goes along with the explore, connect, protect, 
is to get people out into the streams and help them better understand what's going on there and if there are any problems or issues, ways that we can help address those. And this is a map of the state that shows the major river basins um, from the Four Rivers Basin in Western Kentucky all the way to the Big Sandy River Basin. And we, uh, Watershed Watch has uh, distinct basin groups for each of these areas. All those little um, marks, we have sampling sites across the state. And um, our introductory sampling has kind of two components. First, we have these field kits that we use for field chemistry measurements that's, that can only be done uh, at the creek. Uh, and so we look for at dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, and temperature. And then we also, next slide, um, do a grab sample collection. So we use these bottles here with a little form that goes along with it and take those to the lab for analysis of different types of uh, chemical or bacteria components in the water of interest to us. And next slide. Um, we also uh, have a secondary training that helps the volunteers understand the biological conditions in the stream. So what lives in the stream can actually help tell us a lot about the general water quality conditions. And then also looking at how to assess habitat that would tell us how healthy the ecological functions are there and how well it can support um, aquatic life. And um, just a few, High spots is that we were formed in 1998, so it's been in existence over 20 years. We have three annual sampling events. We're preparing for the May sampling event where we'll do field, field chemistry and look at pathogens by checking for E. coli levels. And then we do that again in July and September. And in September, some of the basins also look at metals and nutrients. And then we summarize these results in data reports. We have an online data portal and we have an annual conference every year uh, where we present our findings and help volunteers uh, who, who want to take the next step uh, toward acting on their results. And those are our website addresses for general information or the database, the second uh, address. And anyone who's interested in participating is welcome to contact Joanne Palmer or me. And or there's also an interest form on our website at kywater.org. And if you submit that, we'll respond to you and help you get set up. And that's all. All right, great. Thanks, Melissa. So I'm going to leave this up just for a little longer in case anyone wants to write down that information, uh, but I do believe these sessions are being recorded. So later on, you can go back and look at those. Uh, but our, our next speaker is Amy Soner, who's the executive director of Bluegrass Green Source. And um, Amy, we'll let you take over now. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to, to wrap up because I feel like we've gone from um, statewide to local and that's great. And also some of our programs are, are very different, but it's sort of coalesce into what Bluegrass Green Source does. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, we are a nonprofit that serves Central Kentucky, as Lyndall mentioned. Um, our mission is to empower the bluegrass to create a sustainable environment. And we do that by encouraging your neighbors and your parents and your kids to that, uh, and your grandparents even, that small changes really can add up and make a really big impact right here in Central Kentucky and in your backyard. So why do we do that? You can change the slide. Um, we follow the Kentucky Environmental Education Council, which is a statewide agency, does a, a survey every five years. And found, in the last survey, found that only 55% of Kentuckians can answer general questions. What is a watershed? Where does our energy come from? And so we feel like this is a, a direct um, reason why we need to get out there and do some, some outreach to the people in Central Kentucky. Um, we reach over 100,000 people each year. Last year was a little bit odd, but generally over 100,000 people each year with this direct environmental education. Um, a couple of the things that the survey found, which I thought were really important, is that most of the people in Kentucky believe that you can protect our environment and our economy. And in today's day and age, with polarized, everything being so polarized, I thought that this was something really to hold on to and to really be excited about. Next slide. 
So how do we do that? How do we do what we uh, do our environmental education? Well, first of all, we talk about environmental education uh, in this sense as our preschool through high school program. So everything from working with with you know preschoolers, third, three year olds, and four year olds, and getting them outside and understanding how nature has patterns and things like that, to high schoolers and talking about careers and green 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 infrastructure careers or green careers in general. Um, all of our K twelve education is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards, and it's designed to be experiential. So you're actually hand, you know, doing things hands-on and, and you're not just listening to someone chat. Um, we also supplement teacher education. So we're not doing anything new. We're just taking what teachers are already doing and, and um, giving it a little bit more context into the world. Next slide. Um, our outreach programs, this is sort of our, what our adult programming. So this is um, what we do, we really base it on social marketing. So the idea that you can change your behaviors or how do we encourage you to change your behaviors. We have programs where we do workshops that provide education and help break down barriers, uh, help people understand how they can have a lush lawn, for example, without putting all the, just blanketing it with chemicals. We have a business program where we certify businesses as, as, um, as sustainable. Next slide. We also do a lot of volunteer and community events. Right now for Earth Day, we are um, doing uh, 24 cleanups in Central Kentucky over about nine days. Uh, there's a lot, about a thousand people will start volunteering, really trying to be part of that sort of uh, show that that small change is a big impact. You're, you're only picking up a bag of trash, but you're collectively picking up eight tons of litter. Uh, we also did a sustainability summit recently, which was really successful, where we brought in regional um, sustainability people from Louisville, from Cincinnati, from Bowling Green, and had them discuss some of the actions that they're doing and the successes they've had. And then we had local Central Kentucky people talking about some challenges and opportunities that they saw and it resulted in action teams. So now we have four action teams on waste, energy, water, and agriculture to figure out how individual people can really help bring Central Kentucky um, get past those barriers. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight in my last 30 seconds was um, a, a resource that we've recently created um, for a virtual world, but it sort of brings all the things that I talked about together. So the website is there, bggreensource.org slash watershed improvement. You can see this in more detail because I'm going to go through quickly. Um, but if you go to the next slide, you can see part of the aspects of this. So this is all a website that we created. Um, the first part is really dynamic understanding of how of water quality and water quality exploration and watersheds, um, everything from videos to um, um, to graphics. The next one. And then how to get involved. Watershed Watch is on here. You can go to the next one. We're just flying through these last ones. Student activities. So these are hands-on things that you can do with stuff that you have already in your cupboards. Um, so just a, a quick view of sort of a comprehensive idea of what how Bluegrass Green Source works. I think that's it. All right. Great. Thanks, Amy. And mm -hmm. so uh, here's contact information for uh, Bluegrass Green Source. And so um, now I'm going to uh, open the floor up for questions. We, we kind of went through that quickly. You can see there is a there is a lot of information and a lot of activities going on in the state related to our waterways and a lot of opportunities to get involved if you'd like to volunteer. So uh, at this point, um, I'll see if there's any questions. Um, if you've got a question, you can use it to use the chat, uh, the uh, chat feature, or if you'd uh, like to ask a question, you could raise your hand and we can we can unmute you. I think. All right, all these shy people. Maybe yeah. we went through it too fast. <laughs> I can ask a question to help us get started then with something. You know, based on the earlier presentations, um, were there anything? Were there any areas that were um, presented in terms of funding opportunities? Because sometimes, you know, citizen science isn't always, um, you know, publicly supported, but yet, you know, you know, I don't know. Are these uh, grant programs good for citizen science? And then also. Um, what are some of like, you know, the public benefits or outcomes beyond just the uh, data collection, which is informative in its own regard, but, you know, what does this do for people? A great question. And that is something that has been uh, on my mind a lot um, after I took over as chair last year, because we want to engage and retain our samplers. And at first, it's interesting the first year or two to see what kind of results they get for their stream of interest. 
Um, but I am having discussions with Division of Water on ways that we can better target our sampling sites so that the data is more meaningful and impactful and something that they can utilize and maybe even like help them get to achieve their goals, like identifying a priority watershed and providing some baseline water quality data. Or if there's a site where they've been pouring a lot of grant funding in and doing different projects, has that water possibly met a level that um, deems success monitoring so that they can see how much the conditions have improved. So that is something I really want to work toward with the organization. Thanks, thanks, Jason, for that question. Um, here's a question for from uh, Laura Magnus. She says, I live on a fairly well-traveled road in Rowan County. I'm getting a lot of trash. Um, uh, I'm getting a lot of trash in the dish between my property and the road. What can I do? I clean out often. My watershed is in the North Fork of Triplet Creek, which I think goes into the Licking River. That is in the Licking River Basin. Um, Triplet Creek did have a watershed initiative, uh, a group that was working on um, different water quality problems. Um, I also, yeah, I can put you in touch with the Licking River Basin Coordinator who helps um, local residents address issues like this, and she might be able to give you more individualized attention. I'll send that to you. Yeah, and at one time, Eastern Kentucky Pride had a very extensive program that was addressing solid waste uh, issues. Uh, I think that organization still exists, but in a much reduced capacity. Any other questions? Yes, John. This is, uh, <clears throat> am I unmuted now? I guess I am. This is sort of, maybe it's peripherally, but I know the big Sandy intake. I, I was looking at our, it's been a couple of months now that the annual report of our local water system, which comes out, which noted that they exceeded some of the basic standards um, during one or two days, I don't remember how many, several months back uh, in their annual report and said that it wasn't really a health problem, <laughs> but probably was a health problem that it didn't exceed the highest, highest, highest limitation. I just wondered, you know, as a matter of, uh, you get this piece of paper months later that tells you they may have had a real problem, but it's uh, it's really too late. So I don't, I don't know if we can do anything about it. I, mean, I suppose it's better than not receiving any notice, but I'm sure they're following some regulation. Um, and I don't know whether the purification system in that respect, you know, they may be doing, I think overall, it's probably as good a system as, as anybody has in Eastern Kentucky. But I, the fact that they sent it out so, you know, months later is something that I was a little concerned about. I don't know if anybody has any comments about that. Yeah, I could address that briefly, John. I think you're probably referring to um, just the, uh, this would be drinking water utility you're, you're referring to is sending out yes. notices of uh, compliance. So as, as you alluded to, the state does sample uh, and monitor water distribution systems for lots of different constituents. Uh, and if there are certain numerical violations that exceed limits, then they're required to notify their customers of those. Uh, but if there's any immediate health um, challenge that would typically be associated with those, they would typically intervene uh, immediately if there was some uh, immediate health consideration. But as you alluded to, uh, there's a wide range of chemicals that are looked at, and um, those limits are kind of set uh, by EPA in consultation with other scientists and researchers 
Sometimes those are a moving target. They change over time, uh, but those probably are reflective of the current standards. So uh, Jason, did you have anything to add to that? I think you're muted. I think you're muted, Jason. I'm all, am I I'm muted now? It was yeah. a it was a, a host a mute control thing. So yeah, I'm sorry um, about to, that. You're all good. Um, you know, I guess I could say that you know one problem is is when people are renters, like at an apartment complex or something like that, they may not have access to the reports, and um, you know some fun things like disinfection byproduct rules and things like that when they're exceeded, you know. It, there's a long term risk, but some people may want to have the information a little quicker. But I think a lot of it's just what the national standards are in terms of uh, communicating information. And it's like an annual report. But, uh, you know, it's based upon an older system of communicating information. So um, some utilities do uh, put their information more regularly and more frequently on their websites. But um, that's above and beyond. Um, so getting them to go above and beyond the minimum, I think is always a, a challenge and especially when they're resource limited and there's only a handful of people working for the utility in the, in the area. Um, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's always a good question. You know, my students often, you know, say I've never seen that report before. I've never seen it because they've been uh, renting their whole life or their parents saw the report as part of their bill and they never saw it. So uh, you've raised a really good a good question uh, with regards to the folks on public utilities. Um, you know, it's 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 a, a national issue. I think I think people want information quicker and want it now. And you know, if it's available, let's do it. But I think it's a great question. All right, thanks, John. And I think uh, our time is up essentially for this session. So we're going to. Um, basically let you all jump off to see if you wanted to visit one of the other sessions. And then we're basically gonna go back through this session again. So if you came in late, uh, if you wanna stay on for that, or we'll let you all uh, basically exit the meeting and uh, join another, another session. And so I'll give you all about a minute before we get started. Thank you. Thanks for y'all's participation.